Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Henderson Hills. So great to see all of you here. My name is Ryan Whitaker, and it's a joy to serve as one of your elders here. My family has been here for over 15 years, and we know this is a great place for you to belong. So great to see your smiling faces. Now, that being said, today's sermon is going to make you angry. At least I hope it does. And that was a harsh contrast, I know, but stay with me here. That's important. Now let's pray and seek God's guidance for us before we dig into the text this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father, you are holy. Let it, be, let it not be said of us that we honor you with our lips, but our hearts are far from you. Instead us, Instead, as we open your word today, help us to see the seriousness of worshiping you rightly. Teach us through the contrast between Eli's sons and Samuel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 11 through 26. Again, 1 Samuel 2, 11 through 26. So this month, we have started a new sermon series over 1 Samuel, and it's called He Shall Reign. And in this time, we're still before the days of kingship, and the main character so far has been Hannah. And she is a faithful woman who was unable to have children. And so she cries out to the Lord, Lord, give me a child, and I will give him back to you. And the Lord blesses her and gives her a child, and she names the child Samuel, which means asked of God or heard by God because the Lord hears her prayer. And so now Hannah is about to leave her son Samuel at the tabernacle under the care of Eli, the high priest. And last week we saw that uh, John showed us that before she leaves Samuel, Hannah prays a prayer and she sings a song of praise to our God, saying, my heart exalts in the Lord. And in a bit of foreshadowing, in verse 7 of this chapter, it says, he brings low and he exalts. In fact, that's what I want us to see this morning, this harsh contrast between those he brings low and those he exalts. He brings low and he exalts. In today's passage, we see God in his uncompromising holiness condemn corrupt leaders. And these, these corrupt leaders, they stand in such harsh contrast to righteous leaders. And praise God, God raises up righteous leaders even in the midst of unflinching evil. You know, in, in tough situations, when things seem lifeless, we listen desperately for the beat of a heart. And when we hear it, the heartbeat stands in such contrast to the silence that surrounds it. You know, today's passage, it dwells on the sins of Eli's sons. And in it, we wonder, where is God in this? Where is he? He's silent. But we find God's heartbeat that punctuates the silence. And that heartbeat is Samuel. So let's all stand, if you're able, as we read God's word together. 1 Samuel 2, 11 through 26. And listen for the contrasts here. Listen for God's heartbeat. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. And now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or, pedal or a kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. And this is what they did, to, did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. 
Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would, would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they lay with the women who were, at the, were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? For they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor and also with man. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Verse 11 here, it sets up this righteous top line of the story as we see in full this picture of a worthy family and a worthy son, a worthy son. It says that Samuel's parents, Elkanah and Hannah, they go home to Ramah. Remember, Samuel is only three or four years old at this time and he is a little kid. And so imagine this, mom and dad have circled through the drop-off line at church Hannah leans over to little Samuel and says, give mommy a kiss. And she takes her thumb and rubs off the remaining breakfast on his cheek. But this drop-off is different than any that we're used to. This drop-off is permanent. And so after they've wrung out every possible tear, said all their goodbyes, they, they ride away from Samuel. A couple weeks ago, a whole new category of pain and joy opened up for us that we've never experienced before as we moved our oldest son, Owen, into college. And there was something otherworldly special about that final night together as we're circled up in the parking lot of Hideaway Pizza, praying. And after we've said our goodbyes and we've wrung out every possible tear, we ride away from Owen. And there's no longer six of us in the car, there's five. What did we talk about on the drive home that night? Nothing. It's complete silence for over an hour. And when we get home, there's where Owen parks his truck normally, and it's it's empty. That's a difficult joy. It's a difficult joy. What was the ride home like for Elkanah and Hannah? Well, we know that Ramah is about 15 miles away from Shiloh. And since they don't have a minivan, the journey takes about six hours. What did they talk about on that ride? Well, I imagine nothing. And that night, Kids in those days normally slept really close to the parents. So imagine this as Elkanah and Hannah climbing into bed that night. Sammy's mat is empty. I'm sure that was a difficult joy for them. In Hannah's prayer in verse one of this chapter, we saw this last week. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. And this is her giving, even in giving her only son to the Lord, she is rejoicing. She's glad hearted in the Lord. She's not rejoicing that Samuel's gone, but she's rejoicing in the Lord. She's glad hearted in the God who we can trust in his good purposes. We know that he is 
good and she knows this. And Paul writes of this state of being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. This is a rejoicing that can be had only in the Lord. Paul, Paul writes that our kids are not our own. Love your kids, grow them up in the Lord, for they are his children. Samuel's left behind in the tabernacle to minister to or to serve the Lord under the care of Eli the priest. And Eli isn't just a priest, he's the high priest. He's in charge of the tabernacle. He's the line and lineage of Aaron and Levi here. So now the silence begins. Now buckle up, because we're about to be introduced to Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. That's an introduction, right? It's an introduction. Clearly, these guys right out of the gate are worthless sons, worthless sons. And the literal translation here says that the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. And Belial is a word that means worthlessness or destruction. And the word capital is capitalized also, Belial is, as if to personify this idea of worthlessness. And Paul even talks of Belial as another name for Satan in 2 Corinthians 6.15. So these sons are worthless! Exclamation point, exclamation point. They are the opposite of Christ. So why are the sons worthless? Well, God gives us context clues here. They did not know the Lord. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't care about the Lord. And they are worthless because of the train wreck of sin that's just about to explode. And what makes this especially painful is that these good-for-nothing sons are priests, and either of them are in line to be the high priest eventually. And, And priests were God's representatives. And priests, as you know, were the mediators between God and his people. And so what does mediator mean? A mediator offered a sacrifice on behalf of the people to atone for sins and to bring them back into right relationship with the Lord. And so the priests, they taught, they, they blessed, they interceded, they led worship, they, they did all these things. They led in all these ways, and yet they did not know the Lord. And it's shocking, Now, priests then were different than pastors are nowadays. But imagine an elder or a pastor teaching and feeding, leading, caring for the flock, but they don't know the Lord. It's shocking, right? But unfortunately, not uncommon. It seems there's nothing new under the sun. And we'll see now an example of the train wreck of wickedness in verse 13. What are they doing here? The sons are are having their servants stick a fork into the pot and they're pulling up the best meat as much as they want. And you may not be aware of this, but priests in those days, according to, to law, priests were allowed some food from sacrifice, but only certain parts of the sacrifice, certain parts of the animal. And instead, Eli's sons are having a party. They're having a barbecue. They're choosing the choice marbled ribeye for themselves. And these sons of Eli are stealing from the people and they're stealing from the Lord. These guys are enjoying their best life now. They're enjoying life in the priesthood for what it gives them access to. And we'll see more of that here in a moment. They don't believe that these sacrifices are doing anything And therefore, they are making a mockery of God. And so there at the end of verse 14, it says that this is what they did to everyone who came to worship there at the tabernacle. They didn't discriminate. They did it to everyone. And they stole from the Lord. Paul writes to people like this in Philippians 3.18 when he says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And maybe you already feel something boiling up inside of you, some anger, maybe, I hope. And let's set some expectations here. It's only going to get worse. We're in a sin crescendo here. In verse 15, we see that the sons demand the meat to be raw so they can cook, grill it however they want instead of boiled. And they demand the fat too. You see in Leviticus 3 and 7 that 
The fat is the best part of the offering and it's to be burned on the altar. And burning fat is giving the best to the Lord. It's not to be eaten by the priest, not to be eaten by the people. It's giving to him what's exclusively the Lord's. And you know this to be true. The fat is what gives the most flavor. It's what makes grilled meat smell amazing. And the Lord agrees. It's a, he accepts it as a pleasing sacrifice to him. And if the worshiper hesitates on these demands at all, the servants would take the animal by force. And I imagine the priest's servant grabbing the sacrifice like a basketball player grabs the basketball and throws elbows and does everything he can to hold on to that meat. And I imagine it's a lot more forceful, more violent than that even. And so in this stealing, verse 17 says that the sin of the young men was very great because they treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. And sometimes I can be awkward. Am I alone in this affliction? Sounds like it. Okay. <laughs> About 20 years ago, my wife and I, we were in Canada. And we had just done a museum tour. And there at the exit is a man who asked me, he said, how was your tour today? And so I, I turned to him and I say, oh, it was, it was very great. And my wife, my wife smiles and looks at me and she says, it was very great because who talks like that? <laughs> Nobody talks about something that they enjoy as, as very great, okay? No, what, what this passage is saying here is that it's not, when it says very great, it's not talking about how magnificent the sin was. It's talking about the magnitude of the sin, so this very great sin that describes the difference between their sin and the holiness of God. There's an infinite chasm there between what's on one side, the holiness and the pure and perfect righteousness of God and the, the wicked thoughts, actions, attitudes of these sons. It's infinite, this chasm. It's very great. And the sin is very great because the, the brothers treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. In other words, they're dis disrespecting the offering. They are considering it worthless. Can you imagine that? The wor these worthless sons considering the things of God to be worthless? Think about your own giving to the church. It's sacrificial. It's costing you something. You're giving cheerfully as you've decided in your heart and worship to the one to whom all blessing, honor, and glory is due. And you're acknowledging that what you're giving is his anyways. It's an act of worship. So think about how these priests are at least cutting off the worship of God's people, of God. And at most, they're turning people away from the Lord. And if you remember, Shiloh is the only tabernacle. It's not as if people who are upset by these sons could just go to the tabernacle down the road. No, there's, there's only one sticker on the back of everyone's donkey. And it's, and it's for Shiloh Tabernacle. And it's written in the papyrus font. These sons are evil. They're sinning. They're interfering with worship. And God is not pleased. And in all this, it seems like God is silent. Where is God? So in verse 18, by God's grace, we are jolted and relieved to hear a faint heartbeat of God. And by way of harsh contrast with the sons of Eli, we see the little Samuel. And he is serving and he is growing in the Lord. He's walking in God's presence. In a spiritual wasteland, Samuel stands as a young sapling and he is growing. It says that Samuel was ministering before the Lord. And I wonder what that might have looked like. We have some idea of what that could look like in the next chapter, 1 Samuel three fifteen. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. 
And it seems that one of his duties was opening the house of the Lord to people who come to worship the Lord. And praise God for this example. It's so important. It reminds me of our faithful greeters here every Sunday morning. For me, it's usually Troy and Mike. So thankful for them. But praise God for this. It prepares your heart for worship, to be, to be greeted and to have a warm smile as you enter into the house of the Lord. Every role is important. Every part is important in God's church. 1 Corinthians 12, serve. So then at the end of the day, Samuel probably closed the doors. Maybe he cleaned the floors there of the tabernacle, likely imperfectly. Somebody probably had to redo it. And he's probably running errands all over the place for the aging Eli. And in verse 18, Samuel is wearing a linen ephod. A linen ephod. It's priestly clothing. It's like a white apron. And it shows that he is training to be a priest. So Samuel's faithfulness shows us that we can serve the Lord faithfully, even in the midst of evil. So in verse 19, we see that each year Hannah's family comes to offer sacrifice. And we also see that Hannah brings Samuel something. We see that Hannah makes a little robe to bring to Samuel every year. We already know Samuel's young. We know that he has to be little. We know that the robe has to be little to fit him. And yet scripture underscores this by using the word little. And I think that's there to emphasize the humanity, the emotion that's in this family picture. It's not as if Hannah and Elkanah are robots and it's, hey, it's no big deal to drop off their little son. No, it's a close-knit, loving family picture here. Every year, she makes a little robe for her little Samuel and nothing makes her happier than to see him and to, to give him that robe because he's getting so big. You know, and there's something kind of cute also when our tiny kids dress up in nice clothes like adults, right? Around Christmas every year at our house, we have a, a ton of ornaments, including all these ornaments that our kids have made over all these years at church and at school but there's always one ornament in particular that always gets us. And it's this, this ornament, this picture of Alec, our son, when he was three. And he's wearing this little red polo. And I, I wish I had this picture to show you. Uh, oh, hey, I do. There we go. <laughs> so Every time I read this passage, I think of Alec in his little red polo, because he's getting so big, right? <laughs> so Hannah, she is once unable to bear children, and now the Lord has blessed her with six total, including Samuel. God poured out blessing on her in response to her faithfulness after she gave her first child back to the Lord. Now, in verse 22, we drop back into the silence. We see Eli's weak rebuke, his weak rebuke. So it's in, in these verses that we see that it had to have been excruciating for Hannah and Elkanah to drop Samuel off. You know, Paul, in, Paul in Acts 20, he describes people like Eli's sons as fierce wolves. Fierce wolves, people who attack the flock of God. And Hannah and Elkanah leave little Samuel with fierce wolves. And I believe that they knew that they were doing this too. Why? Because everybody is talking about it. What were they talking about? We read it here that Eli's sons were sleeping with the women who served at the tabernacle. They're using their position of authority to take advantage of and hurt women. And this news is spreading abroad. And also, did you catch that? That Eli kept hearing all that his sons were doing. That he kept hearing reveals a deadly passivity that ultimately brings judgment on Eli's household. 
Even though Eli was a devoted priest, even though he showed compassion to Hannah, even though that he was critical in the mentoring, raising up of Samuel, he was passive in disciplining his sons. He was passive in that he didn't remove his sons from the priesthood. He chose his sons over the way of the Lord. And so judgment comes. Eli's probably in his 90s here as he ekes out what seems to be his very first rebuke of his children. And so Eli tells his sons later, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? This is a hint to us that we need a mediator. And devastatingly, in the second half of verse 25, we read that Eli's sons would not listen to the voice of their father because it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. And that seems to say that the will of the Lord was that, uh, that, they, that they wouldn't listen to their father. The will of the Lord to put their sons to death puts and reveals a severe judgment against them. And it goes beyond just disobedience. Their hearts had become so hardened and their contempt for God's holiness so severe that repentance was no longer possible. And this is a sobering picture, isn't it? Even those who seem to be a part of God's church can face severe eternal consequences if they continue to defy the Lord. R.C. Sproul, in writing on the holiness of God, he wrote, God's grace is not infinite. God is infinite. God is gracious. We experience the grace of an an infinite God, but grace is not infinite. God sets limits to his patience and forbearance. And he warns us over and over again that someday the ax will fall and his judgment will be poured out. That's right. Eli's weak rebuke fell on deaf ears and the ax sharpened by their own sin, falls on them. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't care about the Lord. They were worthless. And hear this, the Lord will protect his name. Ezekiel 36, 23 says this, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. That's right. God will vindicate the holiness of his great name. And for what purpose? So that the nations will know that he is the Lord. And now verse 26, God's heartbeat sounds in the silence. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. We see that Samuel is worthy of favor. He continues growing and he's growing in favor with not just the Lord, but also with man, which is important to see because it shows that people are starting to see and recognize his faithfulness, his integrity, his godliness. See this also, the verse also draws a clear line from Samuel to Jesus. And maybe this piqued something in your mind as you read this. Jesus increased, this is Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The parallel is no accident. Samuel is a type of Christ, which means that he's meant to remind us of or point us to Christ. And as Samuel walked faithfully in God's presence, God considered him worthy of favor from God and from man. What do we do with this passage today? Knowing that he is the one who brings low and he is the one who exalts. Well, three things, I believe. We listen, we rise, and we respond. Listen, rise, and respond. L-R-R. First, listen. Maybe you're trapped in a time where it seems like God is silent and his heart, heartbeat is so hard to hear. The silence is deafening. The tears won't stop. And you keep wondering, how did this happen? 
how did this happen? Over and over and over again, you ask this question. Listen for the heartbeat of God. Deuteronomy 31 declares, it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Matthew 11 assures us that his burden is meant to be light. Psalm 68 says that he daily bears us up. Psalm 34 says that he is close to the, to the brokenhearted. And then Romans 8 declares that he is providentially working good in every cir- circumstance for those who are his children. These are the heartbeats of truth from God's word. So reach out, link arms with somebody who can walk you, walk alongside you with these truths. You're not designed to struggle alone. Come up to us after the service down here. We'd love to listen to you, pray for you, and get you connected to someone there. Listen for his heartbeat. He's not silent. Second, we rise We see that God is faithful to exalt or raise up the righteous even in the midst of corruption. So even when it seems like the world is spinning out of control, God is in control. Isaiah 46.10 says, and he is faithful to raise up righteous leaders just as he was with Samuel. Not perfect leaders, of course, but pray for, support those who God raises up faithful pastors, elders, leaders who model godliness and integrity. And so when I say leaders, though, it's important to understand this. Does that mean just a select few? No, I believe every one of us in here can lead righteously, if not by position, but influentially. And so maybe this question is for you. Is God raising you up? It's God raising you up. For example, are you able to teach English? Let me ask you to commit to a year of teaching English in beautiful North Africa. Why? Because I promise you, God will use you in ways you could never imagine. If that's you, come talk to me after the service. Is God raising you up for that? Or are you a dentist? And I know that's a very specific question. There's a very specific need for you at Ministries of Jesus. If that's you, come talk to me afterward. I can get you connected to Ministries of Jesus for that. If you know a dentist, put a bug in their ear. We need you. There are a million other places to serve. hhbc.com forward slash serve help. God is faithful to raise up righteous leaders. Is that you? Third, we respond. Consider this. Maybe if you're honest with yourself, maybe your life looks more closely to Eli's sons than it does Samuel. You've been searching for true deep joy and you can't find it. In fact, you seem to be moving further and further away from that. I want you to hear this. There's hope. The sacrificial system that Eli's sons corrupted point forward to the perfect, uncorrupted, unstolen sacrifice that Christ would offer on the cross. Christ succeeds as our great high priest where Eli and his sons failed. Through Jesus' death, his resurrection, we are no longer condemned by our sin, Romans 8 one declares, even our very great sin. And we have new life in him. So if you haven't already, today's your day. Respond in faith, trusting in the finished work of Christ. Trust him as your king and your savior. We listen, we rise, we respond in praise to our King because He is the one who brings low. He is the one who exalts.